Hello, everyone. I am Joe Flick with the Montana State Library, and I'm here with my friend Bryce Maxwell, who is um, the coolest guy who knows everything about bats that I know. And, and he's here to share a little bit about what the Natural Heritage Program uh, does for the Montana State Library. And even more importantly, he's going to walk th you through the Montana Field Guide, which is a tremendous, wonderful resource that every librarian needs to know about. So Bryce, I'm going to stop screen sharing and hand things off to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Joe. Um, my name is Bryce Maxwell. I'm the program coordinator at the Montana Natural Heritage Program. Uh, we're uh, one of the program areas of the Montana State Library. And uh, can you confirm that you're seeing my screen there? We can. It looks wonderful. Great. And I'm going to wait a second. I am going to turn on our captions here this today. So you'll see those start coming across your screen. And if you don't want to view them, everybody does have the option of uh, re, uh, reducing or removing those captions. So I just wanted to mention that. Sounds good. Um, there we go. For whatever reason, it is doesn't want to go to slideshow. Huh. It looks fine the way it is. We can see everything. Yeah. Well, I'm going to I'm going to uh, leave it as is, I guess. Um, so uh, just to give some introduction to our program, uh, we again our program in the State Library, we have a long history of collaborating both with the Nature Conservancy and also the University of Montana. Um, and we are one of, and are you seeing that second slide, just making sure? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, we're one of uh, the programs, as, as many of the programs that make up the, our network, um, that is called the NatureServe Network. Um, so there are heritage programs in all 50 states and all the Canadian provinces and some Latin American countries. And um, uh, so we're up to around 80 plus programs in the network and we're housed in different environments. We are the only program that is housed in a state library. So that's kind of cool. Um, and um, one thing I think is wonderful about that is we're in a neutral and non-regulatory situation here. So we're just here to provide our information and, and we don't have a management dog in the fight, so to speak. Um, we manage data on distribution of species and habitats. And this is an example, just a quick summary of, of some of the information in our data system. We have over 3 million observations of plant and animal species in our databases, um, 425,000 plus surveys. And that is some uh, a formal protocol survey has been performed. Um, maybe it's a bird point count or a bat nest netting session or a pond survey for amphibians would be examples or a vegetation plot survey for plants. We take our observation data and we focus on species of concern and we make these polygons called species of concern polygons shown in the bottom left. And that is kind of a, a key point of information that goes out for any kind of environmental review permitting or planning efforts. And that, you know, was uh, uh, one of the bases of the uh, focal areas of the legislature when they created our program back in 1983 was having information that could be used in environmental review permitting or planning uh, processes that could um, move those efforts forward quickly, but in an informed way. Um, and then finally, in the bottom right of the screen, you're seeing our uh, example of our models. And we have around 700 uh, species that we have predicted habitat suitability models in place for. Um, and we're going to be taking that, moving that forward and creating maps of predicted biodiversity. An example of that for invasive species, so this isn't um, predicted good, this is predicted bad in terms of um, invasive species that are not native to Montana and where is the greatest risk. This is um, about uh, 40 plus species of noxious weeds are models stacked on top of one another and you can see the western part of the state is much more threatened um, by invasive species in general than the eastern part of the state. Um, we always also manage information on um, the land, statewide land cover layer for the state and also for wetland and riparian mapping for the state. Both of those are critical also in those environmental review permitting and planning processes and especially wetland um, and riparian mapping that 
um, folks might need a permit um, in order to disturb those habitats. So it's important that we have it mapped. Um, in addition to just that distributional information, we try to assign conservation status ranks to species and communities. And uh, in general, if you look at the upper right of this image, uh, we have both a global rank, that's the G here, uh, G1, and the state rank, that's the S, and those will vary from G1, S1 that are critically imperiled at either the global or state scale to G5 and S5, which are secure at the global and state scale. And then you can have any uh, potential combination uh, of those ranks in between. Um, we're managing information right now on over 12,000 species, 12,267 as of uh, a few days ago. Um, and that's about all I want to get into on that slide. Um, but I did want to point out that our field guide, which is what we're going to spend the bulk of the time on today, is very popular. Um, and uh, so we're at over half a million users this past year, um, you know, approaching 700,000 sessions, 1.8 million page views, um, over 10,000 downloads uh, that I'll show you here and then 21,000 hours of use this past year, um, which is up in the 70 hours of use per average workday. So uh, we are getting heavily used. That said, um, I'm amazed at the amount of time that we still um, uh, give presentations and people go, I've never heard of you, but this is amazing. <laughs> and so that's why we need to do presentations like this so that your local users know that these resources are available. Um, so now uh, I'm going to just go to our homepage. This is our Montana Natural Heritage Program's homepage, and we have several web applications that may be of potential interest. I'm going to start with just the field guide. Um, and the field guide has information on, again, those 12,000 plus species that we manage information on, plus ecological systems, which are communities that occur across biological communities that occur across the state. And there are around 120 of those. Um, and then we have a separate guide for invasive and pest species at this point that we've developed in the last few years. So as an example, uh, a couple different ways you can use the field guide. You could drill down. You could click on animals and then say, well, I'm interested in birds. And then you can say, well, I'm interested in owls and what owl did I have in my backyard? Um, and there are a couple of different groups of owls, but um, the common one or the most common are these strigidae. Um, and then at that point, you'll see their distribution in the state plus photos of individual species. If we click on um, uh, great gray owl as an example, I'll take you through that account. Um, and um, so each of our accounts, we have uh, photos for um, individual uh, species. And we try to try to have photos for all the life history stages of the species, if possible. So adults and then um, there's a little fuzzy uh, juvenile that's just about to fledge. Um, and then where possible, we'll, you know, even include nest and, and egg photos. I'm not sure we have them for great gray owl, but um, to the right, we have uh, information on the conservation status ranks. So there's that global and state rank that I talked about earlier. And then also what, you know, what conservation status do agencies, land management agencies represent or recognize these species as having. So great gray owl is sensitive uh, species for the BLM, so it entail um, more focal management um, when they're developing uh, some sort of uh, land use uh, effort. Uh, we also have sound files. So I'm not sure that you'll hear this. Hopefully you were able to hear that, but we have sound files for all the birds and all the amphibians and then a few mammals that um, make notable sounds. Um, you could hear it just fine. Oh, that's great. Good. Thanks for letting me know. Um, we have general description information. Uh, what are the diagnostic characteristics and, and what are you know, maybe some similar species that species might be confused with? Um, their range in the state based on all the data that we're managing. Um, their continental range. Um, and we actually do the whole Western Hemisphere if, if their range is that large. Um, 
We include information in our databases on the relative density and recency of observations. So you can get a feel for that. And then we break down the observations by whether they're breeding records or overwintering records or somewhere in between. Maybe it's just during the migratory uh, time periods. And then we'll summarize those records by month of the year by years that they've been reported. And we also include a summary of the elevational profile of the records. Um, we share the data generally on the field guide for everybody in this, in, in like in this very generalized format. Um, but we do have uh, precise data that we share with natural resource managers and we can make that available for, again, environmental review permitting or planning efforts, uh, which is a major focus of our program. Um, information on migration, habitat, um, and then information on the major habitats that the species uh, occupies. So for instance, um, let's look at one of those. Uh, if we just click on that, that'll take us over to our ecological systems field guide. And our ecological systems field guide is very similar. Habitat photos uh, showing you what that, what that habitat looks like. Uh, general description of the habitat, um, where that habitat is distributed in the state and um, higher densities are in darker colors in this map. Um, some information on the basic environment of the vegetation species that occur there, a crosswalk with the National Vegetation Classification Scheme, um, any dynamic processes that are important for that habitat like flooding, fire, or grazing, um, anything that's important to management. And then we crosswalk ba back um, to individual species that are known to either commonly or occasionally occur in those habitats. So again, we could loop back to uh, great gray owl um, and then we'll, we'll go down that, finish that account out. Uh, so food habits, ecology, reproductive characteristics, and then down at the bottom, we are trying to be a major gateway for literature on the species. So this is literature that is cited in the account and then uh, additional references on the species that we are just continuing to add into our observation database uh, over time. So, um, so that's kind of an overview of drilling down in the field guide and looking at an individual account. Um, and uh, I want to also note that you can use the search box up here in the upper right to um, search for individual species. And um, so, you know, if I know what it is, then I can go to it and learn more about it. Or if I don't know it's common loon, but I'm like loon, I know that, then you'll see all of the various loon, loon species that we have in the state. Um, we do have plans to expand the guide and um, allow people to search by um, the morphology of the species, meaning what color are they, how big is their bill, um, you know, it, does it have fur versus feathers, that kind of thing, uh, to help people uh, navigate to species that they've never seen before, um, or just, again, don't know what it is. Um, so that's another, another thing that we have planned. Um, and then I did want to, before I get into too much detail more on the, on the general structure of the field guide, um, just get into this invasive and pest species uh, section of the guide. We have different guides under that section for aquatic invasive species, noxious weeds, those are state listed um, or county listed noxious weeds, uh, forest pests, agricultural pests, and then a grab bag of other non-native species that have been documented in the state that aren't um, maybe on one of those, those lists. Um, and then also biocontrol species because that is becoming a, a, you know, a bigger in, um, portion of managers or a, an important portion of managers toolbox to control these invasive species is the uh, insects that have been introduced to control them. Um, so um, go back up to the top of the field guide one more time. And I just wanted to note that we do offer downloads of these so people don't have to be online all the time. They could download a guide to all the mammals in this bottom right section here, where all the birds, or reptiles, or amphibians, fish, and so on, um, without even going through the rest of the guide. Alternatively, if they start drilling down, we'll do it with plants this time, if they start drilling down in the plants guide, you'll see a little PDF symbol here uh, in the upper right. And if they click on that, or whatever level they click on, let's go to conifers, which are the, the pine trees of the state. So now if we wanted a guide for all of the conifers of the state, we could just click on 
that PDF, um, figure out where we want to download it, which that's an okay place for me. Um, select that and open that up and you would have your own guide that you could take, maybe put it on your uh, tablet, um, maybe put it on your phone if you've got some PDF uh, software on your phone. And then you've got an offline version that you can use um, anywhere you're at in the state. Um, and these are very simplified accounts. They have that general distribution map that we talked about before. Um, and then also the month of the year, a general description and habitat, and then, and then that's it. They, well, they do have the conservation status ranks as well, but and only one photo. But essentially it's kind of a one pager on individual species um, that you could um, download and have as an offline resource. So, um, let me go back. It's pretty helpful if you're heading off into the wilderness and you're going to be, yeah. you know, yep. unconnected off the grid a bit. Yep, absolutely. And then I did want to note that at, at every level as we drill down and I'll, I'll show you at other levels as well, I've, we've had this view images tool. And so that can help you identify, wait, I think the needles that I saw in that uh, tree look more like this than they do this. And if you click on that, then you'll you'll get taken to that species account. So um, just keep that in mind that there's another tool there to help um, find out what you're seeing in hand and not having to search sort of blindly through the field guide. Um, let's go back up and let's say uh, we're in the plant guide again here. And let's say um, that uh, we wanna drill down further Again, conifers, um, and let's say we want fir, hemlock, larch, pine. Um, at that point, we're going to get a listing for individual species. And then where we have one developed, uh, you'll see a range map. So we are continuing to develop these range maps for uh, plant species. We have them in place for all the animal species, but we're continuing to develop them for, for plant species. Um, and that also can help you identify, well, what you know, what was this thing or what am I seeing here in terms of where I'm at in the state and, and in general, what it looked like. So um, I also wanna point out that we have an advanced search option on the field guide right under, right next to the search box here. We've got this advanced search button here and there are uh, different ways to search this. But the main thing that I want to point out is that you can make your own custom guide or anyone can. Um, and you can put in the title of your guide and then you can say, um, and here's where you have to probably do a little bit of looking up unless you have some scientific background. Um, but let's say it's Halloween and I wanna make a custom guide that includes my, my three uh, favorite bat species in the state. Um, I told you he was a bad guy. <laughs> so I'm going to do one here where I'm going to say create PDF and I've got, I've got a couple errors here. Okay. And it's giving me some ideas here. So let's say I search for Entrosis pallidus. Um, then I can go look up. Oh, I just spelled it wrong. So that's, that, that was my bad. Uh, Entro Z, I put two O's in there. And let's search for Lazarus. Lazarus borealis or Cenarius was what I was thinking. So there's a question in the chat, Bryce. Do you have yeah. images, winter images for plants? Um we actually, that's a really good question. We do have uh, an effort going on right now where we are working on uh, developing a, a winter guide to plants when they don't, uh, to, um, to plants that have lost their leaves in the winter. Um, so that is coming here. Careful what you wish for, Sarah. You just might get it. It's a great idea because plants do look really different when you don't have their leaf structure to 
depend on for identifying them. All right, let's try that. Oh, there and another go. question. What about skulls? Yeah. Do you have any? Um, that is something that we haven't gotten into yet, but I think at some point we probably will. Um, we probably will include uh, skull uh, images in there um, because I do think that's an important identification tool. Um, and I'm sorry that took me a little bit longer than uh, I'm not sure I butterfingered something there, but here we have test guide. And then we have our three bat species, our little brown myotis, our pallid bat, um, and our eastern red bat um, guide. So again, you could make a custom guide for whatever species you're interested in, and then that, and then download that and use it. So it's a great outreach tool. Science teachers, I would think, would you know, would would uh, really be able to make hay with this um, in terms of you know making. Uh, lesson plans for their kids and whatnot, both the online guide as well as the offline guide there. Um, and that was found under the advanced search options the advanced on the main search, page. At the very bottom of the advanced search. Now, one other thing that we get questions on quite a bit is, well, what about, could I get a list of species for my area? And if you're on the main field guide right now, we are here. In the upper right, you'll see species snapshot. So I wanna make sure that everybody is aware of this species snapshot. And the species snapshot is a great way of getting those lists of species documented in a particular area. And so there are filters on the upper uh, edge here. And we can say, well, I want, um, maybe I'm a, uh, a county or a town here, but you obviously, let's say Beaverhead County and maybe I'm interested in just the mammals and just the mammal um, mammals that are species of concern for Beaverhead County. There's 18 species there. I can open that list up and, and get a list of all of them, see how many observations we have for them in Beaverhead County, how many of those species of concern occurrences. I can download that as an Excel file, or I can also download it as a PDF file. So let's just do that real quick. And um, again, very similar to what I was showing you before, it's showing you your search criteria on your first page, and then it's gonna give you a one pager on each of those species that were on that one to two pager on that list. Um, what I did wanna point out is that even though I chose county, the, the number of different possibilities here is pretty immense. Uh, we do town, which is a 10 mile buffer around any town, major town in the state east and west of the continental divide, mountain range. I use this actually all the time myself when I'm gonna go on a backpacking trip. And I say, well, I'm gonna to go to, um, I'm gonna go up to the um, Beaverhead Mountains in South, uh, well, let's say the Big Snowies, that's a more isolated, Big Snowy Mountains, submit. Um, I think I still have it on mammals, let's say all animals. So there's a list of, um, Oh, and those are species of concern animals. I could take that off. And so there's a list, you know, right at your fingertips of 146 species that have been uh, animal species that have been documented in the big snowies that I could download or export to an Excel. So um, with that, do we have questions? I, I appreciate you, Joe. Um, bringing my attention to the chat. Do we have other questions or, or does anybody have questions? We'd like to invite folks right now. You can unmute your microphone if you wish and get in here. Um, like I said, Bryce is like the bat guy. So if you have, uh, it says, oh, that's funny. The, the Zoom text, speech to text, call it the bad guy, but you are the bat <laughs> Now it's still calling you the bad guy. That's funny. Anyway, <laughs> I did. I did want to say um, again. Anybody can can chime in at, at any time with a question here. But I did want to note that again. One of our primary functions is to again provide species lists of species or biological communities that occur in various places around the state for environmental review, permitting, or planning efforts. So we can generate our full environmental summary reports that fit right into any kind of 
Montana Environmental Policy Act um, evaluation process or National Environmental Policy Act um, process. So that's something to make your um, um, patrons aware of as well. Well, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I have a question. Yeah. If I if I see something that it may be in an odd spot, I I view a badger where I didn't expect to see a badger. Is there a way for people to report that to you or let you know about it? Absolutely. So let's um, let's say you're in that scenario. Hopefully you're seeing my screen again there. You're on the field guide and you've uh, seen We do badger. see your screen, okay. You are seeing it? Yep. Okay, great. So you've seen, seen a badger. Uh, just to the right of the photo is submit um, observation. And so that will take you through a process um, if you've got a login with a, an account with us, uh, you can do that. But if you don't, we just have you enter your name, phone, and email so that we can follow up if we have any questions. And I'll, I'll just quickly take you guys through that. Um, there is a question about, as you're thinking, uh, making your way through that, yeah. asking if you connect with schools at all to collect data for the we field. We do uh, in a couple different ways. Um, let me just quickly show you this and then I'll get into that. So basically in terms of submitting an observation, it's as easy as clicking on a map um, and you'll see the latitude longitude coordinates in the bottom got loaded in there and then that looks good. So then it's gonna ask me who the observer was and the date and what animal did I see and then some comments and then you can submit it. And if you have a whole animal list, you can choose this option in the upper right, submit and add another. You could either add another location or um, add another species to the same location. So um, yeah, in terms of, um, and I'm happy to share this, but uh, let's just go there. One thing that we're doing, working a lot with right now is iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is a, um, a group um, of, uh, it's a national effort to essentially put people in touch with what is around them. And we have in iNaturalist, so iNaturalist.org is the, is the website. But within that, we have our Montana Natural Heritage Observations Project. And so uh, we're in, it, this is a great um, citizen science application. And essentially, let's say you knew it was that badger that you were submitting. Well, you can type in, this is a badger, and then other people out there will evaluate. Yes, indeed, I agree. That's what they saw was a badger. But you can also see a really cool beetle on a flower that you have absolutely no idea what it is. Take a photo of it and submit that. And then somebody out there in that citizen science community who has the expertise with those beetles and a lot of agency folks who have that expertise use this app will chime in and verify what you've seen. So it's a great way to learn. Um, so iNaturalist and uh, there's another program in association with that called SEEK, S-E-E-K. And S-E-E-K, SEEK, is um, an app that you can literally hold your phone up to something and have the, your camera on and it will uh, try to identify what you're seeing. And quite often it will, it will you know, try to get you to maybe the order of the family of the species that you're seeing. And sometimes it actually gets you right to the um, identity of, this, of the very species that you're seeing. So, so again, iNaturalist and Seek are two great apps that we recommend for people to submit observations to. And if you do that, join our Montana Natural Heritage Observations Project and we'll get the data from that as well. well thank you, Bryce. We're kind of at the end of our time here, but um, lots of thank yous for your presentation. And I will gonna go ahead and stop our recording. Hopefully you'll stick around for a couple minutes in case anybody has any additional yes. questions. I'm happy to stay on and thank you for attending everyone.